Good morning, everyone. Thanks for joining our webinar today on the topic of NFPA 70, uh, Article 430. As most of you are aware, this is a two-part series with the second one scheduled for this Thursday, which is 21st March at 10 a.m. Central. Uh, please make sure you attend the second part to get your CEUs. Um, again, this topic is specifically focused on motors, motor circuits, and controllers. Um, as you go through this webinar today, please type in your questions using the webinar dashboard and they will be answered at the end. Our uh, presenter today is uh, Charles R. Miller. Uh, Charles spent 18 years as a successful business owner and electrical contractor. Uh, since then, he has focused his time and energy on uh, writing and teaching on the topics of electrical safety and installation practices. Uh, primarily to promote knowledge and proficiency among engineers, electricians, and tradespeople. Uh, throughout his career, Charles has passed more than 45 master electrical exams and also seven electrical inspector exams too. As an author and illustrator, uh, Charles has an extensive list of electrical-related publications to his credit, uh, including some published by the National Fire Protection Association, um, which is NFPA, and Miller also sits on two NFPA committees, including the committee for the NFPA 70E, uh, which is uh, electrical safety standards. Without further delay, I will turn it over to Charles. Good morning. This presentation is part one of Article 430. Uh, the objective for today's presentation is to have a good understanding of what is covered in Article 430 understand some of the key terms that pertain to motors and motor controllers, know when to use the motor nameplate amps, which is sometimes referred to as full load amps or FLA, and when to use the full load current or sometimes referred to as FLC from the tables in the back of Article 430. Also to be able to calculate locked rotor current. Now what's in Article 430? In the scope of Article 430, which is 430.1, this tells us that uh, Article 430 covers motors, motor branch circuit and feeder conductors, as well as their protection, motor overload protection, motor control circuits, motor controllers, and motor control centers. Here's an illustration of some of the things uh, that are in Article 430 and some of the things we're going to be calculating in this Part 1 presentation and the Part 2 presentation covered in a couple of days. Uh, starting at the motor, we, we're going to know when to use the full load current or the table values in the back of Article 430. Then we have a motor controller with motor overload protection. We're going to look at those requirements and go over those. We've got branch circuit conductors. How do we calculate those? What uh, current or amps do we use? And, and what kind of a percentage are we going to uh, multiply by, by the ampacity or current? Then if we have a motor, um, a, a panel board or switchboard like in this drawing, that covers, uh, that contains motors, we're going to be able to calculate uh, the, the motor uh, branch circuit, short circuit, and ground fault protection for each of the motor or multiple motors if, if we have more than one on a, a fuse or breaker. And we're, we'll go over the requirements for this. Then we have the motor feeder conductors, we, and there are motor feeder and short circuit and ground fault protection. Motor control center, the, this is a, um, a piece of electrical equipment that is covered in Article 430, and it's stated in the scope. Motor control center requirements are in this article, Article 430, which is in Chapter 4 of the National Electrical Code, the NEC. Motor control center is defined in Article 100. Now, when, when a term or word is in more than one article in the code book, then it will, we're going to find the definition. If, if there is a definition, we're going to find it in Article 100. Motor Control Center is in more than one article in the NEC, so that's where we find the definition. As defined in Article 100, a motor control center is an assembly of one or more enclosed sections having a common power bus and principally containing motor control units. 
Well, where are the requirements? Well, they're in part eight in Article 430. This section or this part covers motor control centers installed for the control of motors, lighting, and power seats. Some of the conductors and equipment that might be inside an MCC bucket are a motor branch circuit conductors, and we'll find requirements for those in part two of Article 430. Part three, we're going to find motor overload devices that might be in an MCC bucket. Motor control circuits would be found in part six. Motor controllers, part seven. Motor branch circuit, short circuit, and ground fault protection is going to be in part four of Article 430. Motor disconnecting means can be found in part nine and adjustable speed drives, part 10. Now, all of these, of course, are not going to be in each and every motor control bucket, uh, MCC bucket, motor control center bucket. And this, we might find some, one or more uh, of these uh, devices or these parts, these pieces of equipment inside an MCC. Here's an illustration of a motor control center, otherwise known as, as an MCC. I do my own drawings, I do my own illustrations, and, and years ago when I started this, and I, I decided, well, I'm gonna put my own brand name on these. In fact, you'll see in the upper left-hand corner, this is a Miller brand. Uh, of course, I'm Charles Miller. Uh, this is the Square M. You've probably heard of Square D. Well, this Square M is the Cadillac of equipment. This is some really nice equipment. So we, in my illustrations, uh, in, in my books and, and magazine articles that I've done, uh, you'll see uh, typically my brand name. I, I'll stick on those. Well, it, since I draw them, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to draw my own brand. A controller. While some of the terms that pertain to, to motors are defined in 430.2, which is, our, which is the definition section of Article 430. The, if there are terms or words that are defined in a particular article, then they're going to be found in the dot two section of that article. For example, 430.2 has a controller that is defined in this, this particular section, this, this 430.2 section. Again, as I mentioned a minute ago, if the term or word is used in more than one article, then it's going to be defined in Article 100. But here's a term, controller, that we actually find in both Article 100 and Article 430. A uh, controller, as defined in 430, uh, is, it, it's, well, it's, it's not only defined in 430, it, of course it is in Article 100. Well, let's, let's look at the definition for Article 100 first. As defined in Article 100, a controller is a device or group of devices that serves to govern in some predetermined manner the electrical power delivered to the apparatus to which it is connected. Well, a controller, it, we might think of that as a, a switch. We might think of it as a, a disconnect or safety switch. Well, what about controller as used in Article 430? For the purpose of Article 430, and this is the definition in 430.2, a controller is any switch or device that is normally used to start and stop a motor by making and breaking the motor circuit current. Well, we, we typically call this a motor controller. Uh, the, the code book is, is going to, in Article 430, is just um, typically going to use the term controller. Um, it, of course, we're also going to find in the NEC the term motor controller. The definition of controller in 430.2 is also applicable to the term motor controller, of course. Uh, instead of referencing it as a controller, we have a, we have a term or terms that we use out in the field, and we usually reference these as, as calling it a starter or a motor starter. So here's an example of uh, an illustration of this great Square M, this Miller brand um, combination motor starter. Um, motors, uh, motor controllers can also be motor starters, combination motor starters as this one, uh, manual motor starters, inverse time circuit breakers, and motor case switches. Well, where do we find requirements for all of these? Um, Article 430, Part 7, and the sections that cover this 
are part or 430.81 through 90. While industrial control panels uh, may contain equipment such as motor controllers that are referenced in these, the motor controllers, of course, are referenced in Article 430. The industrial control panel itself or requirements pertaining to industrial control panels are not in Article 430. Article 409 covers industrial control panels intended for general use and operating at 1,000 volts or less. An industrial control panel, as defined in Article 100, is an assembly of two or more components that consist of one of the following. It had number one is power circuit components only, such as motor controllers, overload relays, fuse disconnect switches, and circuit breakers. Number two, control circuit components only, such as push buttons, pilot lights, selector switches, timers, switches, and control relays. Let me go back to the previous slide here. This is one of the few times the term subpanel is used in the NEC. Out in the field, we know and we call a panel board that is not at the main distribution panel, one that it comes uh, uh, is not the main panel, but a we call it a subpanel. The code does not reference that uh, uh, as a subpanel. That's but we call it that in the field. If we we have maybe a, a main distribution panel and we have a, a breaker and a feeder conductors that go to another panel board, then we typically call that other panel board downstream of the main a subpanel. But the NEC, the code does not reference that as a subpanel, it just calls it a panel board and maybe even a remote panel board. Here's an illustration of an industrial control panel. Now, it, industrial control panels typically do not contain the motors and the equipment that they control. They can uh, contain the control equipment, uh, such as uh, like this, this drawing, we have a handoff automatic switches, we have the, the starts uh, and the stop switches, and we even have a uh, a grace engineered product that has been built into this particular industrial control panel. Variable frequent frequency drive or VFD is often one of the components that is in an industrial control panel. A VFD is one type of electronic adjustable speed drive. Well, what is an elect uh, electronic adjustable speed drive? Again, here's a term that we may need to understand a little bit better. So what we're going to do is look for the term to see what is the definition. We have the definition of this and it's going to be in, in Article 100, adjustable speed drive. Uh, power conversion equipment that provides a means of adjusting the speed of an electronic, uh, of electric motor. This, and that is the definition of an adjustable speed drive in Article 100. There's an information no, informational note which several editions or maybe multiple editions back now, informational notes used to be called fine print notes. In fact, they were abbreviated FPN, and which stood for fine print note. Then uh, it was it's been multiple editions back now. The FPN, the term FPN was taken out, and the the words informational notes uh, was put in. Now, an informational note is not a requirement. It's not, uh, it, it's not enforceable. It's there for information only. It's like the, the annexes or informational annexes in the back of the NEC. Well, what does this informational note say under adjustable speed drive? It says a variable frequency drive is one type of electronic adjustable speed drive it controls the rotational speed of an AC electric motor by controlling the frequency and voltage of that electrical power supplied to the motor. Uh, we sometimes call these drives. There are, of course, other types of drives out there, and they they we they're they're called adjustable speed drives in the NEC, but it may be a, a variable frequency drive or VFD, it might be a DC drive, and, and some of the other uh, types of drives that are out there. 
Figure one, looking at the very first part, if you have your code book, look at the very first of article 430. There's a figure 430.1. This figure serves as a type of table of contents to all of article 430. In fact, this figure is broken into, it can be thought of as, as two parts of this figure. There's a, there's a top half, uh, which is a list of all 14 parts as they appear as you're going uh, part by part through Article 430. The bottom half of that figure, 430.1, shows the components or elements in the relationship to the motor. All right, let's look at this. This is the top half of figure 430.1. And notice on the right side, numerically it goes parts, it starts at part one and goes down the page or down this list to part 14. This tells us what exactly in what order is covered in article 430. Uh, so example, if we're wanting to find requirements for motor circuit conductors, then we're going to, for for example, branch circuit conductors or feeder conductors, we're going to look in part two. Um, then if we, what about overload protection for heaters or overloads, what we typically call them, then it's part three. And so looking at this, uh, we, we go all the way down to the, the last item that's covered in article 430 are tables. Uh, tables that contain full load currents of motors, uh, tables 430.247, 248, 249, and, and 250 are our main uh, tables for full load currents. And we're going to look at those and talk about those uh, later. Um, all right, here's the bottom half of figure 430.1. Notice about three-fourths of the way down is the motor. Well, requirements pertaining to the motor itself are in part one. We come up to this and, and come up from the motor or come out from the motor. We're going to have, um, or, or back from uh, the motor to the source where the power comes in, we have overload protection. Uh, that, that rectangle where the lower arrow is pointing, it represents motor overload protection and the requirements that pertain to motor overload protection. And where are they found? Well, look over on the right side. They're found in part three of Article 430. Then we have motor controller uh, and, and motor control circuits. We going up the line that goes up and down, which is the, the top arrow is pointing to, would be that, that line represents motor branch circuit conductors and those requirements are in part two of article 430 and we're going to cover those as well some of these all right so the calculations uh, sizing motor overload protection I, I don't have minimum and maximum but we will find out that there are standard sizes that we we will we can look at and there are are also maximum sizes for overload protection. We're going to be looking at that. All right, then we go to the next bullet point down. Determining the minimum ampacity that's required for branch circuit conductors. Well, so we do a calculation and the minimum size conductor, it says for putting into a particular motor after we do a calculation, we're going to have example of this. This is uh, conductor sizing is going to be covered later. And so we do a calculation. We find out the minimum size conductor in accordance with the NEC might be a, a number 12 or a 12 AWG conductor. Does this mean this is the conductor we have to put in? Well, no, of course not. The, condu the, the conductor we could put in instead of a number 12, we could increase the size of the conductor and put in a number 10. The code contains minimum provisions. In fact, you may have heard um, for a long time now, the NEC contains a minimum set of codes and, and rules and regulations. Well, it, it talks about this in article 90 it doesn't exactly say that anymore it used to say that around 1968 or it may have come out in the 1968 edition but it, it was more uh, it was stated more like 
the, the NEC contains minimum uh, codes and standards. And that's kind of where we get that from, although it doesn't say that today. Well, let's look at the last bullet point there. Our calculations could be uh, giving us, we could be calculating for branch circuit, short circuit, and ground fault protection. Uh, okay, what size fuse or breaker is the maximum rating that we can put that's protecting, that, that's on this motor? All right, so this is going to give us, in this calculation, it will be the maximum size, the maximum fuse or rating that is given. And can uh, kind of like the, the conductor size, can we do something different? Well, absolutely. Like the conductor size, we could increase the, uh, the size, uh, raise the size conductor to the next uh, size up or two, whatever, whatever we're wanting to do on that. The calculation for the conductor is a minimum size. Likewise, the calculation for branch circuit, short circuit, and ground fault protection is the maximum size. So with this, uh, say our maximum size came out to be an 80 amp overcurrent, uh, 80 amp, not an overcurrent device, but what we're sizing with motors uh, is going to be a short circuit, uh, a branch circuit, short circuit, and ground fault protection. So instead of putting in an 80 amp breaker, maybe we want to drop it back to a 60 amp breaker. And that may be okay as long as we're not, as long as the, the fuse or breaker will allow the, the motor to start and run. The other things that we have as far as minimum and maximum, we, it, we calculate in Article 430 the mac, minimum ampacity if we're calculating feeder conductors. All right, so maybe they come, come out as, as 250 MCM or 250 KC mill conductors for feeder conductors. Well, we may want to increase that uh, to 500 MCM or 500 KC mill. And again, that's permitted, but our calculation is going to give us minimum sizes. Uh, also, in, we have for determining maximum size feeder, short circuit, and ground fault like the branch circuit. Now, this would be for the feeder if we are, are installing a, a switchboard, a motor control center, uh, uh, even a panel board where we have uh, motors and, and this type of equipment in there. So we're going to look at how to calculate uh, branch circuits. Uh, we're, we're talk about feeders, but we're not really uh, going to have examples showing the calculation for the feeder conductors and uh, short circuit and ground fault protection for the feeders. Table values in 430.6A1, this section gives us a requirement. It tells us what uh, it, it tells us what value or what ampacity that we need to use on our calculations pertaining to motors. So 430.6A1 says, other than for motors built for low speeds, well, what does that mean? Well, less than 1200 RPM or motors built for high torques and for multi-speed motors, the values given in the tables in the back of article 430 430.247 through 430.250 have to be used to determine to determine what? Well, it goes on to say, if, if you're calculating ampacity of conductors or ampere ratings of switches or branch circuit, short circuit, and ground fault protection, instead of the actual current rating marked on the motor nameplate, what this means is we have to use the table values for the tables in the back of Article 430. Well, what tables are back there? It starts out, or the, the tables we have back there are uh, single phase motors. We have D, well, it starts out DC, then we have single phase, then we have two phase, then we have three phase for the 430.247, 248, 249, and 250. We have DC single phase motors, two phase motors, and three phase motors. And if if you if you're not familiar with the table back there that is for two phase motors, 
this is for motors that are in two-phase uh, electrical systems. Now, I've seen a lot of systems out there. I have never seen a two-phase system. What this type of system is, and, well, let me, let me start out with the single phase and three phase, and then I'll, I'll explain what a two phase is. Single phase, of course, is two hot wires and a neutral, this type of system. Now, the motor, of course, may not, it may not or would not use the neutral, but a, a, a single phase system has two hot or two ungrounded conductors and one neutral. A three-phase system has three hots or three ungrounded conductors and a neutral. And so a two-phase system has four hot wires, four ungrounded conductors and a neutral. I have taught a lot of classes uh, over the last 40 years, and I have met one person, maybe two, that have ever seen a two-phase system. And where, again, the, you have four hot wires and one neutral. The conductors are 90 degrees out of phase with each other. But anyway, so our main conductor, main tables uh, for ampacities that we're going to use in here, the, the ones that are used most often are the single phase and the three phase tables. These table ampacities are necessary. They're required when we're calculating um, conductors, when, you're, when we're calculating the ratings of switches, when we're calculating branch circuit, short circuit, and ground fault protection, uh, and we have to use these instead of the actual current rating that's marked on the motor nameplate. Now, we can use, and there is a point in time where we can actually use the motor, the nameplate amps on the motor, and we'll talk about it later. Motors built for low speed, less than 1200 RPM, or high torques, may have higher full load currents than the full load current shown in the tables in the back of Article 430. Multi-speed motors will have full load currents that vary with changes in speed, of course, because it's a multi-speed. Uh, with any of these types of motors, use the nameplate current rating uh, in all the calculations. So if it's, if it's the type of motor built for low speed or high torque, uh, which has higher full load currents, then we actually have to use the nameplate rating. There's another type of motor we have to use nameplate rating for as well, and that would be if the motor is not in the tables in the back of Article 4, 430. Here's an example. This 350 horsepower, this Miller brand horsepower square M, uh, uh, Miller brand motor, square M motor, um, in, made in Lebanon, Tennessee. That's, that's my home. That's uh, 30 minutes uh, east of Nashville. Uh, Lebanon is the home of Cracker Barrel. So this particular motor, this 350 horsepower motor, is not listed in the tables. The, this, this, motor, the voltage that this is hooked to is 4160 volts, 4160 volts. The table only goes up to 2300 volts. So, and, and of course it doesn't go for this high of a horsepower as well. So anything dealing with this motor, which is a quite a large motor, uh, 350 horsepower, because of the high amps, this motor only draws 45, uh, because of the high voltage, this motor only draws 45 amps. So all of our calculations with this particular motor, we would use nameplate amps because it is not in the back of Article 430. Well, when do we use the table values? Here's a, a quick and easy slide to, to help you with all of these. We use the full load current rating, and where the, this is, in the code book, it's in paragraph form in 430.6A1. So we're going to use the full load currents, and sometimes this is referred to as FLC, uh, the full load currents in the tables when calculating the ampere rating of switches, branch circuit conductors, branch circuit protection, feeder conductors, and feeder protection. Again, full load current table values are sometimes referred to as FLC. Here's an example. 
a 10 horsepower 208 volt three phase alternating current AC motor will be installed in an industrial facility. When connected to 208 volts, 208 volts, three phase, of course, the motor is three phase. The nameplate shows this motor will draw 26.6 amps. In, in my illustrations, when I have, um, uh, like this one, the top of this shows a model number. Uh, typically, I just don't pull numbers and letters out, uh, out of the blue. It has some meaning. Um, now, it, it has meaning to me. Uh, you wouldn't necessarily, have, this wouldn't have any meaning to you, and that's fine, unless you wanted, of course, to send me a, a birthday present, because CRM, of course, are, these are my initials, and the 09061955 is the, it was my birthday, is my birthday, it was the day I was born, uh, September 6, 1955. So, and, and usually I have, like this, other model numbers, something that is significant. And so this motor is a 10 horsepower motor. It gives other information on here. It gives the voltage at, at 208 volts. Uh, it gives it at two, uh, 230 and 460. Well, the corresponding nameplate amps would be 26.6 at 208, 24 at 230, and 12 amps at 460. It has other information on here that we're going to be looking at some of these things in a little while and what else might be covered or what else has to be covered on motor nameplates. And so when connected to this, to 208 volt motor, to 208 volts, three phase, this motor is going to draw 26.6 amps. Now, is this the, num the number we can use when we're calculating branch circuit conductors, short circuit and ground fault protection? No, no. We have to use the table ampacity in the back of Article 430. And in four again, 430.6A1 says when calculating ampere rating of switches, branch circuit conductors, branch circuit protection, uh, short circuit and ground fault protection, feeder conductors, feeder protection, we have to use the full load current values that are given in tables 430.247 through 430.250. Here's a, an illustration of one of the tables of the uh, this table 430.250, which is the table for full load current for three phase AC motors. So what do we do? How do we find the table value? First of all, you find the correct table. Well, this motor that we're that was on the previous slide is three phase, so we go to table 430.250. It is a 10 horsepower motor, so we drop down to 10 horsepower on the left side. We go across to the voltage at which this motor will be connected, and I stated in the previous slide it's going to be uh, connected to 208 volts. So our full load current for this particular motor in the previous slide is 30.8 amps. 30.8 amps is a bit higher than the motor on the, 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 than the nameplate rating of the motor. And now why, is, why would we want to do this? Why is this, uh, well, of course it, we have to do this because it is a requirement in the NEC. But, but kind of where did the, does this come from? Well, all right, say we have a, a factory that has been built and high efficiency motors have been installed. Well, we have uh, throughout the factory very high efficiency motors. Well, when motors are very efficient, the ampacity is lower. The current uh, draw of those motors are lower. So if everything such as conductors, branch circuit, short circuit, ground fault protection, uh, feeder conductors, feeder protection, switches, all of this were based on the actual nameplate rating of the motor, then at the time it would be okay, well, except for it'd be a <laughs> code violation, but at the time it would be okay. So say in five or 10 years, these motors start, uh, start burning up, they start going bad, they need to be replaced. Well, and, and maybe another uh, company, another manager has come in 
And they said, oh, we've got to go with the, the cheapest motors, which would be very inefficient. Well, when motors are less efficient, the ampacity of the, the current draw of those motors is going to be higher. The current draws of the table full load currents in the back of Article 430 are extremely inefficient. So it is best, and of course we have to, but it, it's best to calculate everything with using these inefficient motors. That way, if we, if we have very efficient motors, we're sized great. If they're inefficient, then this is about as, it's probably as worst as it'll ever get. And so uh, with this, uh, there, there is one thing though that we, we can use the nameplate and that's if, when we're sizing heaters or overloads. And now we're gonna be calculating that as well, uh, but that's really the only time we can use the nameplate ampacity as long as the motors are in these tables. Section 430.7a covers motor markings. Some of the items that are required to be marked on the motor include the manufacturer's name, rated volts and full load current, rated frequency and number of phases, that is if it's an AC motor, rated full load speed, rated temperature rise or the insulation system class and rated ambient temperature, the time rating, uh, rated horsepower if one horse, uh, one eighth horsepower or more, code letter or rock, uh, locked rotor amperes if it's again an AC motor and it's rated a half horsepower or more, and design letter if it's uh, a, a motor that's a design B, C, or D. Here's a nameplate off a motor. Now this is one of those Cadillac of motor, motors, uh, Miller brand or Square M uh, motors made in Lebanon, Tennessee. That's where I live. And the, uh, the nameplate, these are the items that are required to be on a, a motor marked on a motor nameplate. Uh, upper left hand side, we have a rated horsepower. This is a, a one and a half horse motor. It has to have the rated volts. This is a 208 volt uh, up to 230 volt. Of course, it'll work on uh, 240 as well. And then the amps, the full load current or the ampacity, the amps, full load amps underneath the voltage in this uh, on this nameplate. At 208 volts, this motor will draw uh, 9.6 amps. When it's 230, this motor will draw a little bit less, 8.8, .8, because remember with motors, when you have higher voltage, the ampacity will be lower. The time rating is on this motor, and this one is a motor that is used in a continuous duty application. Continuous duty uh, is, we know that because it is abbreviated C-O-N-T on this motor, and it's going to let us know some things later that we need to do with that particular uh, time rating. Uh, the NEMA design letter B is on here. The manufacturer's name, of course. The insulation class is in a box and it's letter B. The locked rotor indicating code letter for this particular motor is code letter H. And that's going to be important when we're trying to, to, to find out or calculate the locked rotor amps for this particular motor. The ambient temperature or what we typically call temperature rise is on this motor and it's 40 degrees C. The cycles or Hertz are on this motor at 60, which is the normal uh, system uh, in the US. Uh, the number of phases, this is a single phase motor. It is 208 volts or 230 volts, so it has two hot legs and it'll have an equipment ground. And so instead of where a three-phase motor is going to have three hot legs or three ungrounded conductors, this has, it, it is a single-phase motor. Now it can be fed or supplied from a single-phase system or it can be f uh, supplied from a three-phase system with just two uh, hot legs or two ungrounded conductors. It has a service factor on this nameplate, uh, which is 1.15, and it has the full load rated speed on here showing the RPM. 
this is a, a motor. It's a swimming pool pump. And in 430.7 uh, A13, it says, if a motor is provided with a thermal protector that, that complies with 430.32 A2 or B2, it has to be marked thermally protected. All right, so let's look at the uh, at the nameplate of that particular motor. And so this uh, this motor is uh, marked thermally protected, which is correct, and because the motor, this particular motor, is uh, thermally protected. Let's talk about locked rotor indicating or locked rotor current. Let's uh, let's look how look at how to find this, how to calculate it out. Uh, code letters marked on the motor nameplate. Uh, they're there to show the motor, uh, to show motor input with locked rotor, and they have to be in accordance with Table 430.7b. The code letter indicating uh, motor input with locked rotor shall be an individual block on the nameplate uh, properly designated. And this is, it all tells us this in uh, Article 430, Section 7b. So let's look at an example. Let's calculate one out. What is the locked rotor current in amps for this motor when this motor is connected to 208 volts? Well, this is a, a three-phase motor. And what we need to do first is we need to find the locked rotor indicating code letter on this nameplate. Take a look and find the code letter. That's correct. This code letter is J. And so with this particular motor, the locked rotor indicating code letter is J. Now let's go to table 430.7B in article 430. On the left side, we have uh, code letters that range anywhere from A to V. And the kilovolt amps per horsepower with locked rotor or KVA uh, per horsepower, and it starts out with A as far as being uh, as low as 3.14, all the way down to V, which is the KVA per, per horsepower is much larger. What that means is uh, the, the motors with a code letter closer to the beginning of the alphabet, closer to A, uh, will have less locked rotor current. The ones that uh, are uh, on toward the V or, or near the end of the alphabet are, go are going to have the higher uh, locked rotor current. All right, so we're looking at this table. Uh, we're looking and we find the, code the kilovolt amps or the KVA per horsepower for the motor in our previous slide, which was letter J. And we, out of these two numbers on the right side, we're going to select the higher of the two numbers. We have 7.99 is KVA per horsepower. So uh, in our, in our uh, the left side of the slide here, I've got 7.99 KVA. And at some point or other, we're going to need to convert this to volt amps in order to calculate amps. And uh, I'm just, I'll do it here at this point. And so uh, 7.99 KVA, and the way we find the total volt amps is taking the 7.99 times 1,000 because K is the metric or the SI for, uh, for 1,000. So we, uh, this, the volt amps per horsepower is 7,990. Well, the motor in the previous slide, the one that we're looking at, we have a two horsepower motor. So what this means is we need this 7,990 is the volt amps per horsepower when it's in the locked, when the motor's locked up. So we multiply two times 7,990 and our volt amps, the total volt amps we have is 15,980. Finally, we're going to find the current by dividing the locked rotor volt amps by the total source voltage of which this motor, uh, the total source voltage for this motor is 360. There's a couple of ways of finding this out, of, of figuring this out. Uh, for a three-phase motor uh, or three-phase, if the voltage is 208 volt, 
we could take 208 times the square root of 3, which is 1.732, or you could have two numbers behind the decimal. And instead of 1.732, could be 1.73 and calculate uh, the, um, the 208 times 1.732, and you're going to get approximately 360 votes. Or, because this is three-phase, we could take the per-leg voltage, or what is the voltage, and this is, fed, this is a three-phase, four-wire, Y-connected system, we could take the voltage per uh, ungrounded conductor, per hot conductor, which is 120, and multiply it by the number of legs or the number of phases we have. How many phases? Well, three. We have three phases at 120, so three times 120 is 360. 360 is our total voltage. So we take 15,980, which is the volt amps uh, for locked rotor for this two horsepower motor, and we divide uh, divide the 15,980 divide by 360. We come up with 44.4 locked rotor amps. Since the nameplate current at 208 volts for this motor is 5.7 amps, the locked rotor current is going to be almost eight times the nameplate amps. And how do we get that? And, and this, this is just an extra step you may or may not do. It's, it's, it's really not needed in order to find out the locked rotor amps. It's just giving us an idea okay, how many times the nameplate amps is this uh, 44 amps? Well, to get, to get the number, we take 44.4 divided by 5.7, we get 7.8, which is almost eight times the, the running current of the motor, the nameplate current of the motor. A rule of thumb out in the field is locked rotor current is approximately six times the nameplate amps. I, uh, I learned this years and years ago when I went through the electrical apprenticeship program, uh, sometime during, during and around that time. But that six times the nameplate amps is, is not, as you can see from our last calculation, is not accurate. Uh, because as shown in this example, locked rotor current depends on code letters marked on the nameplate and not just an approximate number because uh, six times is, is not what we came up with on our previous slide. Our, uh, the, this, uh, this locked rotor current for the motor that we just calculated is almost eight times the nameplate amps. All right, what have we learned today? What have we gone over? Uh, first of all, Article 430 uh, covers motors, motor branch circuit and feeder conductors and their protection, motor overload protection, motor control circuits, motor controllers, and motor control centers. Article 430 contains a number of provisions for sizing motor circuits as well as their components. Some of the calculations in Article 430 will result in a minimum size, and some of the calculations in Article 430 will result in a maximum size. Well, something like heaters or overloads are going to be, which we haven't calculated yet, they're, we're going to see that they uh, will be a, a minimum or standard size of, as well as a maximum size. Uh, conductors are going to give us minimum size conductors. Uh, branch circuit, short circuit, and ground fault protection is going to give us maximum sizes. Uh, also, we learned that it's required to use the full load current or table values for most of the motor calculations. When we're calculating branch circuit conductors, feeder conductors, uh, branch circuit, short circuit, and ground fault protection, uh, feeder, short circuit, and ground fault protection for motors or motor control centers. Uh, we, for uh, calculating uh, the rating of switches, uh, these, are, these are some of the items that we're going to have, um, have to calculate. And, and in our calculation, we have to use the table values, the, uh, not the, um, not the, nameplate amps on the motor. 
Now, we, there, are, there is a time that we can use nameplate amps if we're calculating uh, heaters or overloads going to the motor, but we're going to find that out uh, in part two. Also, locked rotor current can be calculated by finding the locked rotor indicating code letter and using table 430.7b. Thanks, Charles. Uh, we'll take your questions now. And again, uh, don't forget to join the second part of this webinar series, uh, which is on this Thursday, 10 a.m. Central. If you have any uh, specific electrical installation or uh, safety-related questions, or if you'd like to consult with Charles to uh, either evaluate your safety programs or to set up trainings at your facility, uh, you may reach out to Charles directly at his contact info provided on this slide. Thank you.